Welcome to White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Coie mini-pod. Delivered in short doses, this mini-podcast features informal, on-topic discussions with in-house experts, outside counsel, and other thought leaders on a wide array of cutting-edge and practical white-collar and compliance topics. Visit PerkinsCooey.com for more information on our nationally ranked white-collar and investigations practice. On this episode of White Collar Briefly... Marcus Funk, a former federal prosecutor and firm-wide chair of Perkins Coie's White Collar and Investigations Practice, has a conversation regarding criminal justice reform with renowned writer, editor, and publisher Dave Eggers. Eggers is the best-selling author of works including A Hologram for the King, The Monk of Mocha, What is the What, and a heartbreaking work of staggering genius. Eggers has also been a finalist for the National Book Award, the Pulitzer Prize, and the National Book Critics Circle Award. In addition, and relevant to this episode, Eggers is the co-founder and editor of McSweeney's, an independent publishing house based in San Francisco, that publishes Voice of Witness, a nonprofit book series that uses oral history to illuminate human rights crises around the world. The views expressed on this podcast do not necessarily reflect the views of Perkins Coie LLP and should not be considered legal advice. A quick note to listeners uh, to provide some context for today's discussion with author Dave Eggers. When Dave and I, in late May of this year, recorded our first two-hour session covering a wide array of criminal justice issues, we did so just prior to the video of George Floyd's tragic death entering the public consciousness and sparking a global debate uh, about how we as a society should treat suspects, defendants, and inmates. We, therefore, both thought it made sense to record another session during which we could place our discussion about criminal justice reform in the appropriate contemporary framework. And by way of additional background, I've had a friendship with Dave since the late 1980s during our college days when he persuaded me to start writing an opinion column and was kind enough to invite me to be a contributor to Might Magazine. And essentially, he pointed me in the direction of a career in the law. And even though Dave and I have, over the years, had plenty of areas where we didn't entirely agree, I've always respected him immensely, and we've never exchanged an angry word. Instead, we, we've we always had something that has become somewhat of a contemporary rarity, namely constructive discussions, and ones that, to be candid, I tended to benefit from most. And I think you're going to see this in the evolution of my own thinking about many criminal justice topics, including the ones that we cover in this podcast. And finally, and as you'll hear, Dave has, in fact, been a passionate champion of substantive law reform initiatives that are now very much part of the mainstream uh, in public debate. I hope you will find that Dave's thinking on this critical ongoing discussion is both challenging and insightful, and that you're going to carry away an appreciation for why it really is time to reconsider some of the basic assumptions we tend to carry when it comes to arrest, detention, sentencing, and other key issues that are now up for fundamental reconsideration. Well, Dave, welcome back. Thank you. Good to (laughs) talk to you again. When did we talk originally? When did we talk? Yeah. Was that mid-May, maybe? Yeah, I know it was prior to the recent events, the uh, killing of uh, George Floyd, which have overtaken our conversation about criminal justice reform rather substantially. Well, on that topic and with police, I've been obsessed with qualified immunity and how do you make police forces accountable for so long. And you as a prosecutor, I've got to ask, isn't it an inherent conflict of interest to have the DA be the one investigating criminal misconduct on the part of police? Given that they work hand in glove, they have to work closely together and police unions usually donate to DA's uh, campaigns, etc. Isn't it like the exact wrong person to be investigating police misconduct or am I mistaken? No, I think you're you're not mistaken. I think the conflicts of interest that exist when uh, a DA, particularly in a particular, you know, in a jurisdiction, has to prosecute a law enforcement officer, it can create a substantial issue uh, for the prosecutor. And uh, so, as a result, in a lot of cases, when a judge or a prosecutor or a police officer gets charged with misconduct. It will be a DA from another jurisdiction or a federal prosecutor from another jurisdiction that will handle that case. Bouncing it up to like a federal prosecutor, in theory, that seems to make sense. But you're still talking about a law enforcement. You're still talking about people that are inherently aligned, I think, and loath to, uh, I think, disinclined to convict, prosecute a, you know, a fellow uh, you know, 
prosecutors are cops too, in a way. And so it, it seems like that whole notion, it seems upside down. It, it almost seems like you'd want the public defender in a given city to be taking up the case on behalf, you know, inherently if a citizen is shot or killed or hurt or even tortured in custody, you'd think it would be the public defender's job to sort of uh, investigate, prosecute, and try to hold accountable the police involved. Or does that sound like an untenable idea? Well, first of all, you know, ideas that were once considered untenable, I think, are really everything is on the table. My own thinking about criminal justice, even though I've spent the majority of my career, I, in fact, all of my career in the, uh, broadly described the criminal justice area, I am reconsidering a lot of my own presumptions about what's tenable and untenable. I've never thought about a uh, federal defender or a state defender being the prosecutor or being appointed. We obviously have situations where we have special prosecutors appointed, and we have a lot of situations where, again, in one county, a law enforcement officer is charged, and you then go to the neighboring county or a few counties away and have their prosecutor take the case because the relationships are too close. The flip side is in the federal system, let's say in Chicago, where I practiced as a federal prosecutor, you have 120 or so federal prosecutors, you have 900 state's attorneys just in Cook County, and the chances that you'll know any one particular officer, any one particular prosecutor are very slim. And so the Chicago U.S. Attorney's Office has and continues to prosecute federal and state law enforcement officers from the jurisdiction very regularly. But I actually think the idea of a federal defender or a state defender, in other words, a public defender's office, essentially carrying on the prosecution function and prosecuting charged law enforcement officers is, is something I've honestly never heard before, but it's pretty interesting. Why do you think that would be the better way? Inherently, their job is to protect the rights of citizens. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think, you know, typically, the, well, especially the DA's office is closely aligned with the local law enforcement. They're on the same side. They're working closely every day together. So for, I would say, the vast majority of potential police misconduct cases and shootings and deaths in custody have been referred to the local DA's office and almost always dismissed. And, or, you know, they neglect to charge. Even here in San Francisco, the old uh, DA, George Gascon, who mm -hmm. compared to, you know, probably a lot of jurisdictions in the country was on the liberal slash progressive side compared to maybe some DA in Mississippi or something, but even he, in some of these very high-profile shootings caught on video that would now be prosecuted, would have resulted if one of these shootings, like the shooting of Mario Woods here, which was done by sort of a phalanx of cops, nine cops all pointing the guns at a guy who was about 5'6", 120 pounds, in the middle of the day, and they ended up shooting him in broad daylight, that would have resulted in the firings of all nine cops in today's climate. But because it happened in 2015, um, there were no charges at all. And I think it's such an interesting thing. I wonder if you can comment on the fact that the law hasn't changed yet in terms of qualified immunity, but the perception and the political pressure and the sort of awareness finally has changed so drastically and so quickly that like in the case of Richard Brooks, that case never would have gone anywhere a year ago even because the cop would have said, well, he took my taser and he fought back and that's that. And now it resulted in a quick firing of the cop and the chief of police, which is just astounding. It's astounding, the change in atmosphere. I wonder if you could comment. You know, the Richard Brooks case is just another tragic case to see. And actually, this morning I was listening to the radio and a minister uh, was commenting on the Richard Brooks case and observed that, you know, setting aside whether Richard Brooks is fighting back and so forth, you know, in the circumstances, and the, the videotape was about 45 minutes, and the interactions up to the end were actually, in both directions, very unexceptional. But what ultimately happened was an unbelievable tragedy and the minister was observing that, well, why did they even have to arrest him in the first place? Couldn't they have just called an Uber after they, you know, processed him, got his information, they have all the evidence of the of the DUI, and then let him go? And it, when I first heard it, reflexively, right, reflexively, I, I just thought that was just a silly suggestion. 
And then I thought about it a little longer. And maybe it's also been ruminating in my head with our conversation last time. And I thought, well, why is it really? Why is that such? Why do I think that is such a silly suggestion? In fact, why couldn't they just process him, take his information? I mean, we're not in the 1950s, right? You have a computer. You can look up everything. You can have a photo, fingerprints, everything taken care of. You've got all your evidence. And then, you know, obviously don't let him drive home. You, you have to impound the car or whatever. But why not arrange for transportation home? I mean, why does the system think, either from a perspective of the cost, which are, of course, very great by taking someone in custody, in terms of the intrusion on a person whose presumption of innocence maintains? I mean, what is the reason? There's no punishment, in other words, at that point. What is the reason for taking him into custody? And, and actually, as I thought about it, I couldn't come up with a reason why the minister was wrong about that. And it's a very strange and maybe very hopeful experience, at least for me, that that one of my fundamental assumptions, you know, shoplifters and people who are caught with drugs and so forth are taken into custody, that that may not be the best way for the system to react and interact with the public. What are your thoughts about that? In this case, um, just like the mayor of Atlanta said, why not just let him go? They had his address, ID, they know his name, you know. So if things get a little hairy at the end and he runs away, Shooting him twice in the back is something that has happened countless times in the past. I would say in American history, it's got to be thousands of times because the cops get excited and they think, okay, this person's running away. What do I do? I have to stop him because of this idea of, you know, to quote Trump, domination, this idea that we have to control this situation right now or end it in some way right now. And, you know, I've been studying in particular police shootings of the mentally ill for the last five, six years. And um, again and again, it's the same situation where things escalate quickly and it ends up with uh, a citizen almost always unarmed or very lightly armed uh, being shot and killed often in their homes. And it has this sameness to it that has to be a result of terrible training in many cases, completely bizarre priorities instead of how do we handle this so that no one gets hurt? It's how do we end this quickly or end this in a way that is in line with a sense of control and domination. And I think letting Richard Brooks just run and go home and they can deal with it the next day or the next week. It doesn't matter. They could knock on the door another day and say, all right, let's straighten this out. Uh, you're going to have to pay a fine for DUI and uh, take a course, you know, whatever it takes. But it is uh, completely out of line with all other, I think, developed democracies to have this kind of inherent escalation that we have here. And um, I really think it's baked into the way policing is done. And um, here, and you just see it, you know, when the beatings of protesters, and you see it in so many cases, and you see it in the fact that we have between 1,000 and 1,100 police shootings, uh, killings, a year, which is, you know, more than most democracies have in 100 years. You know, it just shows a completely flawed, tragically flawed way of going about policing and indifference to de-escalation. And the number of contacts the average American has with the police is also something that is, I think, unusually high. In other words, every time I drive home, there's a police officer sitting sort of at this one bend waiting for someone to speed. Everyone speeds there, and the police officer essentially chooses what car to pull over. And that's part of, you know, we remember it from Giuliani, the broken windows, proactive form of policing. You know, you pull someone over for, uh, I'm not going to say it's a pretense, but it can be pretty close to a pretense. You know, they've got their tinted windows or what have you. Uh, their their license plate is slightly obscured. And then you go looking for other things, right? And, and most of us, I think, have been in one way or the other, and, and, and in many cases, like my own, very low level. But the way the police officer speaks with you in this sort of like, sir, I'm instructing you to, that slightly robotic, sort of trained, uh, inhumane voice, the looking through the back windows, the looking for something else 
is a problem. And I want to definitely talk about procedural justice and the importance of the justice system maintaining and earning legitimacy and creditworthiness. But I think to your point about these incidents and the over-policing, it is something that I think is unusual. It is also true that American police officers face risks that police officers in Denmark and Sweden don't because of the armed population. I mean, I don't think you can compare, you know, the Oslo Police Department with the Chicago Police Department in terms of what they're facing. Right. Then you get into the proliferation of guns, and then we can talk about the NRA for <laughs> another few hours. Because <laughs> it is all, it's a cycle where if you do have 354 million guns, which I do think is debatable, but, you know, around that number is what is what has been documented or estimated. If you are a cop in a city, yeah, you might be amped up and you might be just more likely to think that there is a deadly threat near you. And in general, it makes cops jumpy. But at the same time, it's fascinating to me to see the drastic differences that I think training and um, and I think even training before cops go out on a beat, you know, I was at the very first protest here in San Francisco. It was a Saturday night, and it turned into quite a lot of looting. And I saw most of the looting. I was there when they broke the first window, and I saw the first shop get looted. And the police in that case... The chief here, Bill Scott, he must have told them, no violence, we're not going to hit anybody, shoot anybody. If looting happens, we're going to try to control it, but we're not going to get violent. And I saw a police force that was pretty well trained that night. Like, they had a lot of provocation and yelling and spitting and throwing stuff at them, and they did barely move. They didn't do anything. And nobody got hurt, not one injury that night. And a lot of stuff got damaged, but I think that at that point, they thought, let's not make it infinitely worse, and we're not going to hurt people over property, and we're not going to shoot people over uh, stolen phones. And in the end, you know, the city survived and nobody died. And I think that that can work. You know, that can have an effect. But when the cops don't go out with that pre-training and with a philosophy in mind and with sort of guidelines, then you end up with all of these other abuses that you've had in D.C. and in Buffalo and, and you name it. And this isn't to say that horrible things still don't happen uh, in the moment. And in the Bay Area, as you know, there's been a few citizens that have been shot and killed during protests um, just across the Bay in the days after Floyd's death. But I think that... Um, there can be uh, mitigations and there can be general guidelines that are laid down. And I would expect, and what, maybe you can comment if you think that, are, are police chiefs around the country right now saying, all right, everybody, whether they're having a morning meeting or in general with memos, whatever they're doing, they're saying, we're not going to be shooting people. All the rules are different now. Your entire you know, approach to policing is is going to be different now than it was a month ago or a year ago. Do you think that those conversations are being had? It's impossible for me to believe that they're not being had. It would be immoral, irresponsible, uh, unthinkable that those conversations are not being had. One of the things that I think differentiates a very good agent or police officers from those that aren't is empathy and, and being able to show a human side, you know, and I'm curious about your thoughts about cops, that TV show and live PD, uh, both being canceled. One of the interesting things, if you watch particularly live PD, one of the interesting things you see is how differently different police officers do their job. And you've got the police officers that do their job. And again, it is a very trained way a very stilted way of interacting with people. Again, the, sir, I'm instructing you to stand here. And, you know, and then you have the other, the, the much more empathetic and humane police officer. And there are many of them that you see on TV, and there are obviously many, many, many of them in the real world that speak to the quote-unquote subject like a real person. You know, hey, how's it going? You, you kind of seem a little strange today. Everything okay? Have you been, you know, ingesting any... <laughs> Uh, any illegal drugs. Uh, you know, in other words, they talk to the person as another person. 
and the impact of that and how people respond to them is day and night, right? People get their hackles up when they're spoken to like the subject of an investigation, like a person that is somehow a bad person. Whereas when a person speaks to them with empathy and with human kindness, even though they may be fully intent on arresting the person ultimately, but there's a huge difference between how people react. And I think this is part of the broader conversation about training and about kind of approach. I think those officers who have that skill, and it's a skill, right? You can learn it, but it's also somewhat innate of showing empathy towards others. Those are the folks that should be the role models because they also get the job done and they get a job done much more effectively. And we used to see it as prosecutors, you know, you'd have a police officer on the stand and they would have these sort of very rehearsed, the terminology would all be police talk. They would sort of face the jury when a question was asked and then face back to the prosecutor. And it took a lot of effort to to break those habits and have them just speak like normal human being would uh, because it doesn't make them any more authoritative or by being stern and, and, and again, sort of empathy-less, I think it makes them less effective, both on the stand and on the streets. What, what are your thoughts about that? And what do you think about live PD and cops being canceled? And I know there are reasons for that, having to do with the way people are por- being portrayed on those shows. But do you think there is an educational aspect to it? I, I've never heard of live PD until I heard it was canceled. And I remember seeing cops like maybe 20 years ago, but we don't have broadcast TV here uh, in my house. And so I, I haven't seen those things since, yeah, it's been a long time. But, you know, I've been reading about cops who are naturally at ease and, and calm on the job and how effective they are when they're calm and not amped up or afraid. Mm-hmm. And cops that are sort of inherently kind of amped up or afraid tend to make mistakes, they tend to overreact, they tend to escalate. And then you see, yeah, exactly as you talked about, cops who are calm and who are are not easily riled up. And they have seen a lot and they're not easily um, frightened. And I think generally when cops shoot when they shouldn't, uh, you're, you're talking about in a lot of cases, cops who get afraid, who are frightened and in many cases they wish they hadn't probably shot somebody and I want to think that it haunts them and then you also have those cops that are again and again disciplined and written up and shouldn't be doing the work and they get often get moved from one department to the next and uh, have uh, a long list of misbehavior, misconduct, complaints, and even shootings. You have out here in the Bay Area, you have many cops who have been part of multiple shootings, a lot of them highly questionable, and they keep getting moved around. But I think that robotic and heavily militarized way of policing is such at the root of so many of the problems. You know, why that robotic, inhumane way of speaking, why that's seen as an effective way to police does, I don't know where it comes from. I don't know when that was adopted. It is so counterproductive. And whenever you have an interaction with a cop that is humane, when they say, okay, I understand, go on your way or whatever, it's good for policing. It's good for their work. It's good for them. It's good for their own safety, for everyone's safety. And I do want to say that while we're talking about this, we just have to acknowledge that we're two white guys and anything that we've experienced in terms of hassles by police. And I've had, you know, at least a dozen experiences that I found very questionable. We have to multiply that by 100 if you're a black man or if you're Latino or if you're some uh, demographic that is being profiled, targeted or treated lesser as lesser than. And so imagine the few inconveniences that we've experienced multiplied by a hundred and infinitely more fraught and violent that if you or I uh, were not white but black, we'd be perpetually on edge and perpetually filled with rage at the way you know, our humanity is denied. And so with those little experiences where you're inconvenienced, where you're walking down the street and you're stopped and, I mean, I've had this in just, the most bizarre circumstances where I'm just trying to live my life and a uh, cop will want to know why I'm where I am and what I'm doing and will come back 10 minutes later and ask me again, 
Can you imagine, like, if that happens to me, what the average black man in America is experiencing, especially by our age, how many times that's happened, and how you could have any support for the police. It's, uh, it's almost impossible. And they've, in so many ways, you know, this rage right now and this movement to defund and turn upside down the police forces is so long overdue, and it is so just. There is no way to think about contemporary policing in America, but that it needs to be rebuilt from the ground up. And I want to talk about the defunding movement and get your opinions about that. But on your point about, and again, I referenced it earlier, procedural justice, it's something that I've been thinking about a lot, in part because I'm in the process of finalizing a a book that talks about that topic. And again, it's this notion that you can try to police people through authority and force, like in totalitarian uh, dictatorships, or you can try to police or run a system based on the system having inherent legitimacy and creditworthiness. The most simple way of looking at it is, obviously, even people in jail for murder would agree that murder is wrong and that people who commit murder should go to jail. And so the idea is that if you have a populace that believes that the criminal justice system is fair and that it deserves credit that you ought to, just by being a citizen or being in that in that jurisdiction, you ought to abide by the law, that that is the most effective, and this is not a big surprise, I don't think it's sort of, it's frankly intuitive, that that is the most effective way of running a system is to try to get the populace to believe in it and not to do it by brute force. And so these little interactions that you're describing, Dave, the small but negative interactions will cause you to develop an opinion about the justice system, stories about corrupt prosecutors or wrongful convictions or bad shootings. uh, All of those things will chip away at your faith in the justice system. Now, one could, of course, argue that some of the bad things are getting a lot of representation, not just now, but historically, whereas the many, 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 many good things police do are underrepresented. But be that as it may, what we're going through right now, I think, is a fundamental test of procedural justice where where I do think that the public has lost more faith probably than at any time that we're familiar with in the U.S. in the system. And the long-term damage to legitimacy and creditworthiness is great. The main reasons for that is that the police unions have been, I think, short-sighted and grossly unfair. Justice has not been served hundreds of times, even in the last decade. There have been, if you count, a thousand police shootings a year, so that's 10,000. And I think that there has been very little accountability. And I think that that whenever there is a a body, whether it's a, a large union like that, that does not police their own, so to speak, and defends their members without regard for you know, how egregious the behavior is, that ends up hurting the majority of the cops that might never fire the weapon, might never do anything wrong by anybody during their career. It hurts them so much. And only now are you finding police chiefs, you're finding statements, you know, after the George Floyd murder, you found, you know, the joint statement by the chiefs of police in in Oakland and San Francisco the day after saying this was a murder, this was wrong, this was against all of our training, this doesn't represent what we do. And even that, I don't think had any precedent in my lifetime. But had there been those sorts of statements when there had been really egregious deaths, even Breonna Taylor, you know, a few months before, and so many others, then you would have had, I think, far more not sympathy, but respect for the badge, and you wouldn't find everybody completely fed up and having no more patience for this because it was completely, nationally speaking, it was out of control. Even though it's a vast country, and again, maybe the majority of police interactions nationwide are positive, but the misconduct was so egregious and so extreme and with a thousand or eleven hundred deaths a year it was so completely unacceptable that something had to break something had to happen and i'm glad that we're at where we are where we're really examining everything starting with all of the places all of the incidents where police don't belong 
And my research is really focused on when family members, when loved ones, when husbands and wives or even neighbors call the police because they have a, somebody near them who is mentally ill, who's having an episode, they call the police or they call 911 for an ambulance and the police come to accompany the ambulance. And then minutes later, that loved one is dead. Those happen hundreds of times a year, too. Police shootings of the mentally ill are about a third of our yearly thousand. So you have so many of these interactions where the very worst thing that anyone could do with a highly distraught person in mental distress, the last person that should be meeting them is a heavily armed cop who starts barking orders to them, get down, do this, do that, don't do this. They are an inherent escalation. And you're finding right now in San Francisco, the mayor of London Breed and her new guidelines for police that were issued with you know, incredible alacrity. She said the cops will no longer respond to any of these domestic cases. They don't belong there and they're not going to be there. These are meant for other social service agencies, but not armed cops. And I think the more we really narrow down what police should be doing and what they shouldn't be doing, the fewer deaths, incidents, and just general misery we're going to experience. And, and I think the respect for the profession will rise when they get to do what they're trained to do and stay out of everything else. And then coupled with infinitely more training and de-escalation and in the value of human life. I don't think anyone's going to disagree with you on the importance of enhanced training on de-escalation, focus on the impact it has on society when a police officer shoots first and thinks second. Again, that is not to deprecate or not understand the incredible stresses that police officers are under, but the expectation of the police officer is going to be a mental health counselor, a marriage counselor, an educator and do all these things, to your point, I think that's an expectation that's unrealistic. And we do see those incidents all the time where police officers put in positions that they, frankly, by training and, and by dint of their job, shouldn't be in. And just to go back, I feel like I want to make the point on prosecutors prosecuting sort of other law enforcement officers that an argument can also be made in a lot of cases that you know, when, when a prosecutor is facing a corrupt police officer, that police officer has essentially disrespected the entire law enforcement community. And I'm thinking of a particular case that I handled involving a person who I knew and prosecuted and convicted. And, you know, you hear the argument that actually prosecutors can be too tough on police officers or folks in their immediate surroundings and overreact to them. It, it sounds like that's not a concern you have in terms of that maybe they're overly eager to punish and make a public display of the bad cop, the bad judge, the bad boss. So rare. I know, you know, I think the case you're talking about, it's just one in a million. Because, again, if you looked at, you know, the Washington Post and the Guardian in the UK put, you know, these databases together of all the police shootings. And it is so exceedingly rare that the local DA will prosecute that cop. Part of it's because of qualified immunity and on this sort of reasonableness of their fear for their life, right? Like that's the language that the Supreme Court sort of has cloaked the police in for a long time, where if they fear for their life, they can shoot, which of course is like this just diabolical subjectivity that cannot be argued against because if you're afraid, you're afraid. And <laughs> so you could roll up to somebody standing outside of a 7-Eleven unarmed. But if you're afraid, then you are allowed to shoot and you will be legally protected. There are two cases in the last five years where naked men were shot. And in both cases, they were black. And in both cases, naked men who were in mental distress and had been, you know, diagnosed with schizophrenia and other mental illness, but the police were asked to respond and minutes later, they lay dead on the street because a neighbor had called them, said, you know, this naked man is wandering our neighborhood. Um, what should we do? The police come. They become afraid for some reason of a naked man and they shoot him dead. And both of those cases got complicated legally. In one case, there was a cop that was fired by the mayor and then he was reinstated or his status as a cop was reinstated and he sued successfully for $32,000 that he won. 
And then the family of the victim got a $3.25 million settlement. But there are just so many egregious examples of a cop shooting because they are made afraid. They shoot you know, Deborah Danner in New York, who was 66, mentally ill woman. They shot her in her bedroom. What threat a 66-year-old woman could have posed to a bunch of cops in somebody's bedroom, I cannot imagine. There are just so many of these cases. And actually, there's a really interesting one in Elgin, near where we grew up, to Cynthia Clements. I don't know if you remember this case, but it was in uh, 2018. Much like George Floyd, neighbor said there's a woman in a car. Police take a look. She's at a dead-end road. They knock on the window. She drives off. They chase her around the highways, I think I-90, um, for a while, and she ended up pulling over. And for the longest time, this is all online. This is all, you can watch this video. For the longest time, they seem to do the right thing. They don't escalate. They're just saying, Cynthia, can you get out of the car? Get out, you know, and she doesn't. And eventually she starts a fire in her car. It's on the tape. And at that point, the cops should be opening the door and helping this woman because her car is on fire. They don't. They stand back. They say, get out of the car, get out of the car. Eventually she gets out with smoke billowing out of the car, and she's a tiny woman, and she's surrounded by huge cops with their guns drawn, and she happens to be holding a knife, but she's choking, gasping, she falls out of the car, and as she's falling out of the car, they shoot her twice, once in the head, and kill her, because, I don't know, she hadn't obeyed their orders, because they were somehow, you know, they were afraid. I, it's impossible to figure out because there's no way she could have posed a threat to anybody, armed or not. And a cop that shot her in the head and killed her faced some scrutiny, was relieved for, I think, a year on desk duty, but then he was reinstated and is now back on the Elgin police force right now. And his name has come up a little bit in the last few weeks after George Floyd, but, you know, he's back. And there was no justice whatsoever for to Cynthia Clements' family. And if this had happened tomorrow, that cop would have been in jail, just like George Floyd's killer, and the police chief would have been fired. There would have been just much more drastic consequences, but this was a drastically different era even two years ago, where a killing of a mentally ill woman choking on smoke on a car on fire is still somehow deemed a threat and is killed on the spot. It's a very, very strange country that we live in. <laughs> There are just some things that completely defy belief that happen here and that we tolerate. And I, I hope that we're at the end of that tolerance. Well, and the U.S. Department of Justice has a public integrity unit in part to prosecute corrupt public officials, which can include police officers and judges and the like. But that's a small unit compared to the universe of cases. And on the statistics you're talking about, I heard yesterday an interview with the head of the Chicago Police Union where he was questioned about the small number of cases where misconduct is found compared to the overall number of complaints. And it's just, it, to your point, it's a very complicated, not intractable, I think there are solutions, but it's a very complicated system. And speaking of Chicago, there's a case that didn't get as much um, traction outside of Chicago, but it's uh, a case from March this year where the Chicago Transit Authority shot on video a 33-year-old man named uh, Ariel Roman, I believe. And he was sort of running on, uh, he was at the top of an escalator when the officer shot him. And this is after he was tasered and pepper sprayed. And he obviously was not complying, but he was also far away and definitely running in the opposite direction. And he was shot twice. He survived. But for another example of what I think can very arguably be set up as an overreaction in the heat of the moment, he was not complying with the officers. The officers were demanding to see his ID, things like that. And he started to struggle with them. They tased him. He seemed largely unfazed, and they pepper sprayed him and then pepper sprayed themselves, as luck would have it, and he seemed largely unfazed, and then he kind of broke free and ran up the escalator and was shot. You don't see him getting shot, but he was shot in the back and I think in the buttocks. As far as I know, the only legal defense for shooting somebody, especially a fleeing suspect, is if they pose a threat to the public. It's like they're running around with a gun. And they've been shooting it or, you know, or, and, and the cops think if they don't shoot them in the back, they're going to go kill somebody. But in this case, it sounds like he didn't even have an underlying crime was committed. And then the cops just escalated it to the point where they shot a man in the back who was unarmed 
and who hasn't committed a crime outside of not giving his ID, right? I mean, it sounds very much like Richard. Well, and, and he assault, I mean, he definitely assaulted the police, right? He was fighting with them and so forth. But to your point, and even though I believe in, you know, the sort of presumption of innocence for all people and that we shouldn't, uh, you know, sort of pronounce people guilty before they have been found guilty, my personal just observation is that that case, unless we don't see him maybe as a gun and he's pointing it at the officer and we don't see it, it is inexplicable and hard to understand how a self-defense argument or defense of the public argument can be made. And on that issue, the rule for all people, including police officers, is that you can only use deadly force if you are in fear of death or serious bodily injury or that the person is going to commit murder or seriously injure another person. And in all states in the United States, as it applies to you and me, right, regular civilians, our belief has to be both subjectively held. In other words, I honestly believed I was going to be killed or seriously injured. And I have to be reasonable in reaching that view. Now, with police officers in almost all states, the same is true. They have to both believe that they're being threatened in that way. And that belief has to be reasonable. There are a few states operating from memory here. I think it's like Nebraska, Hawaii, and Pennsylvania, where the subjective belief, in other words, the officer believes it, and that's all you need to know. If the officer honestly believed they were going to be injured in that way, then they can use deadly force. But on this issue of immunity, one of the things I want to ask you about is one of the theories on immunity is that in a lot of countries, you can sue a police officer, and if they did something bad, if they illegally seized evidence or what have you, you have a remedy against them. In the U.S., the remedy is the exclusionary rule, right? The, the, the famous rule that if you uh, improperly seized evidence, that it can't be used at trial. The theory is that the officers are being punished because their case essentially is deep sixed, right? They can't bring their case because their evidence is excluded. In the real world, I think the incentive structure doesn't work that way. What, what are your thoughts on qualified immunity? I mean, you've mentioned it a few times. What are your thoughts on whether or not police officers or any public official should enjoy some legal immunity beyond that that any regular citizen has, which is to say we don't have any immunity? You know, I don't know enough about all of the origins and I guess justifications for it. I think in practice, it has led to the situation that we're in right now, where people feel a lack of legitimacy and a lack of accountability across the board. And I think whenever you have these blanket indemnifications, whether it's for federal employees, you know, uh, whether it's for police officers, even our inability to, to sue certain corporate entities because of some law or deal made in Congress, I think it leads to a sense of powerlessness and lack of agency and lack of remedy uh, on the part of citizens, which puts in question their belief in, you know, the rule of law and in, uh, in our presumed access to legal remedies to confront injustice. And I think whenever you have these sort of blanket exceptions made or sort of built into the system, then we aren't our, our best self as a nation. I think it becomes, it's, it's not, I don't think, what we were designed to be, which was really a place where any citizen did have, and I think in general does, have the right to bring suit and to pursue justice uh, through a court system that does work generally better than most court systems in the world. So I think that this one area where the, the hurdles are so high and the precedent is so discouraging for holding police accountable and I think in the end, I think it really has hurt the profession. It's hurt the trust in the profession. I just have this feeling, and I do think that we're going to get there in the next five to ten years, that if we can eliminate these blanket immunity or presumption of immunity, if we can hold the bad cops accountable, get rid of them, I think that you would find so many local departments happy they know, I think, generally, who the bad cops are among them. I think if they knew that those bad actors were no longer within the department and they could count on a more sort of congenial relationship with the public that they're meant to serve, I, I would think that they would cooperate and, and give up 
those outliers. But that's me thinks, you know, I, I don't know how many, you know, this bad apple rule is not, uh, I, I, I can't say that I believe that it's a bad apple situation. And I think that there are millions among the protesters that would say that it isn't a bad apple situation. It's a systemic situation. But that, I think, is um, not for me to say. But I do think that whether it's between uh, changing the way that cops are prosecuted, that maybe we have an either an independent prosecutor that's permanent in any city that is independent, that's elected, that is not funded by police unions, can't accept donations, and, and is independent of maybe of certainly the prosecutor's office and the police department, but maybe completely independent of all other agencies, and they're the ones that are meant to investigate police misconduct. In every city, you have different, I think, poorly funded citizens' agencies that are attempt to do this, but I don't think they have the teeth that are needed. I think whether it's the public defender's office or, I don't know, some other body that can quickly and effectively litigate these uh, situations just as you would with any other violent act. And I think it would create a disincentive among the police to shoot unnecessarily, to use so many of these now or very soon to be legal methods like chokeholds. I think that you would, when, when you don't have this presumption that the local DA is going to have your back and that charges are going to be dismissed and that uh, things are going to go away and that there's an independent body that's going to be looking at it and it's going to be peering, they're going to be putting a microscope over you, your career, your methods, and your latest incident, I think that it's going to, one, disincentivize these bad behaviors, and I think it's also going to drive bad actors out of the profession, and, and it might lead to a different kind of recruiting. I think you might find different people attracted to the work if it isn't ever more militaristic and ever more violent. You know what I mean? I think when you see all the gear and all of the ludicrous escalation and uh, increase of SWAT teams in every city and town, you know, you'll find this little town in rural Idaho and they'll have a SWAT team. Everybody has a SWAT team. People have their heavily armored cars and even tanks. It is out of control. I don't know if you agree. Do you agree that departments have become ever more and maybe unnecessarily militarized and that wouldn't you say that the average little town in rural Illinois does not need a SWAT team? I think the focus on essentially the use of force by law enforcement and maximizing the ability to have access to the use of force is a big issue. And the funding, a lot of it happened in the wake of 9-11. It is true that, you know, a police officer walking around like Terminator doesn't necessarily send the message that you want to send to the public. And again, I think if you grew up, let's say, in Western Europe, your odds of having one-on-one -on -one interactions with a police officer are very low. I think in my first 18 years of life, there were zero interactions with the police. When I came to the U.S., uh, again, because of the concept of proactive policing and police officers sort of sitting and lying in wait for speeders and, and the like, you have many more interactions. And I think this brings us to the topic of defunding the police, uh, something you mentioned earlier. And um, how do you see, Dave, how do you, how do you view the movement to defund the police First of all, what's your understanding of what that means, defund the police? And then do you support it? Well, I, I, you know, I, I was reading James Clyburn, South Carolina, you know, talking about, I, I follow an experienced legislator like him. You know, he knows a lot more than I'll ever know. Um, and he said, you know, no, we're not going to eliminate police departments. I think that there are those that would say, yeah, eliminate them completely and abolish prisons and and these two are going hand in hand with a lot of uh, the reading I've been doing. But I don't think that the average person sees a world where there is no remedy for somebody breaking into their car, for example, you know, and then watching them do it or, or invading their home. And, and where would you call if somebody's breaking into your home to uh, steal what's inside or maybe even threaten your family? These things are going to happen. So you do need, I think police for those situations and many others. You know, there's going to be crimes. There's going to be violent crimes and there's going to be people that prey on innocent people. It's just a fact 
of, of life. But I think the shrinking of the police department and the shrinking of the, their scope of work and just like we talked about, all of the different things that they will no longer respond to and making those police departments more servants to the public rather than predators circling a city looking for prey, for example, whether it's looking for somebody to give a ticket to or whether it's shaking down young men of color, throwing them up against the wall, stop and frisk, these sorts of things. I think that kind of thing has to end. These situations where they, you know, maybe even have quotas, where it's quotas to write tickets, quotas to write people up, quotas to find drug sales. And, and I think all of these things disproportionately impact communities of color and they impact poor communities and they do very little to, I think, improve the lives or the overall quality of life in a city. But in terms of responding to real crime, violent crime, crime that makes people feel less safe. And that's where I think the focus of the police department should remain and should be a much narrower mandate. And I love community policing. I always have thought that that's a good idea. In the Tenderloin here in San Francisco, we have a writing and tutoring center in a really troubled neighborhood where it's open drug dealing and, and use all day, every day, 24 hours a day. But they do a lot of community policing there. And there are cops that roam. They just walk. And they're known by everybody. And uh, they're liked by everybody. And they're not busting people for, you know, uh, selling marijuana or selling a dime bag of this or that. You know, they're looking out to protect people's lives and protect them from violent crime. And um, seeing this sort of community policing where a cop can roam a very troubled neighborhood and kind of be universally respected, I think it, uh, it serves both sides. And um, to see these cops that are so calm and so confident, I guess, in the buy-in that they have in a certain neighborhood because they've treated people as human beings and they're looking out for the crime that really matters, I think it's where it should go. I'm babbling, but I do think that when people talk about defunding, I think when you're talking about mayors like Mayor London Breed put a, you know, a new approach out the other day, and when you talk about the mayors acting on the demands of the public, I think there's a nuance there, and I think there's room to make it work for everybody. And in so many cases, I think the police are going to welcome a narrower mandate, and they're going to welcome the opportunity to do the real work, solving crimes, protecting the public, not knocking on windows if somebody's asleep in their car, not hassling people, not profiling young black men, not stopping and frisking, not interfering with somebody just going about their business, not parking on popular thoroughfares and, and looking to write a certain amount of tickets on a given day because you've got to meet an end-of-the-month quota, that kind of a thing. I think all of those things erode public trust and public uh, respect. And I think if you really narrow it down to what only trained police carrying guns can do, I think it's going to be a really different look. What do you think? Well, on the quotas, I, I think uh, the quotas have seen their day. It's hard to imagine that the, the quota system – police officers having to give a certain number of tickets is something that any reasonable person is going to think is a good idea or incentivizes the police in the right way. And this is something I think about in terms of big city policing. There is a very impersonal and disassociated nature of policing that happens when you are in a city of X million people and the chances of you either knowing or ever running into the person that you're policing uh, is close to zero as opposed to community policing. It does take a very special kind of person to be a very good community police officer and to take someone with empathy and to take someone with self-control and understanding. And, you know, to be fair, uh, when I see a lot of the protests, uh, some of the protesters do not seem to have those characteristics as they are screaming and hurling objects at police officers who they've never met before and never will meet again just because of who they are, right? And if you have that us versus them mentality, it goes both directions. I mean, I don't think I'm stating anything, even in the present uh, climate, that it's too controversial. 
But I think it is a human dynamic and the us versus them, which everyone has commented on, is a very real issue. I mean, there really is an us versus them mentality in some parts. And I think community policing goes back to this importance of establishing legitimacy of the community that you are policing and having credit and having earned credit within the community that you're policing, because that's how you generate and motivate adherence to the law and respect for the law, which is the fundamental thing that any functioning criminal justice system uh, that is sort of rule of law based must have. One thing that you and I have talked about quite a bit is mass incarceration. I know it's a topic you've thought about a lot. And I wanted to bring that topic up to kind of explore your thoughts a little bit more on our current, you know, the argument is that we are incarcerating too many people for crimes in which they should not be incarcerated. Kind of give us a little reprise of your concern about mass incarceration. Oh, well, I mean, are, are you, you wanting me to reiterate whatever I, whatever we talked about for two hours the, a few weeks ago? <laughs> yeah, whatever that was. Right, right. Well, I don't think I have a, uh, an especially novel set of insights, but you know we have over two million men and women in our prisons. Um, we incarcerate more people than any other country, and at a you know per million rate, far above any other country. And um, and I think it's a blight on our nation. And I think it shows that we have flawed priorities, and we have a flawed judicial system, and we have an inherently punitive mentality that. It's hard to defend. I think that we are very happy to throw people away for even minor offenses. And I think that there's no more egregious evidence of that than the three strikes, you're out idea that based on a ridiculous baseball metaphor, we uh, give people three chances. And even if that third chance is a very minor property crime, they can go away for life. Um, and I think that that's, um, it's absurd. I mean, it's on its face absurd. It, it is, uh, makes us a mockery, I think, in the eyes of much of the rest of the world. And I think people are just completely bewildered by how punitive we are, even among empathetic, church-going, you know, people who model their lives off of, you know, according to their very empathetic and forgiving faiths, they will take an Old Testament view uh, to anyone that uh, offends and uh, or breaks the law or, or deems uh, or breaks it more than a few times, it's um, it is very unique to us as a country among an advanced civilization like us. We are quite unique in how willing we are to incarcerate and tolerant we are of living in a mass incarceration nation. I mean, I don't know. We've talked about it a lot, but the older I get and the more I've visited prisons and the more I've watched court cases and the more I see people going away for decades for uh, stealing a car, it's just totally unconscionable. It is just upside down. But I think it starts with a very strange relationship we have to the value of human life. And whether it's putting people away for life in prisons, uh, the way we treat people in prisons, the way our prisons are so barbaric in so many cases, I think it's really one of the things that saddens me more than anything about this country that has achieved so many great things and has so many beautiful things about it. But the way we tolerate and the way we support and tacitly are complicit with mass incarceration is really shameful. And to be honest, just quite bewildering. I really respect people of faith, and even those people, and especially some of the more devout people who really model their life off the teachings of Jesus in particular, I can't believe and I can't figure out how they can square their faith with the way we treat people who have broken the law. So if, you, if you're a judge, Dave, the Judge Eggers' uh, court is in session, how would you sentence? So really we're talking about sentencing here what category of crimes or criminals should be sentenced to a jail term, to a term of imprisonment? And what is that dividing line between those who should be sentenced to a term of imprisonment and those who should not? You know this well. That you, there used to be debtor's prison, right? That if you had accumulated a certain amount of debt, you could go to prison, or even your heirs could be imprisoned for the debt that you had accumulated, you know, especially in England. You remember 
this concept, right? Sure. I think generally speaking, I think countries are finding, especially, you know, we keep talking about the more, I think, civilized democracies, whether it's Costa Rica or Norway or New Zealand, where I think they are constantly, I think, as a society thinking of ways not to imprison their citizens. What can we do to create a safe environment for everybody and also one where people aren't thrown away for, you know, property crimes, for example. And so I do think those guilty of violent crimes should be removed from society until such a time as society feels safe with them moving among them. You know, if you have somebody that's committed violent crimes, uh, that's what jails and prisons and that have a rehabilitation aspect to them are, are for. That's why they should exist. This, this person isn't safe among us. That person has to be somewhere where they can't harm anybody and where we can feel safe with them not walking among us because for some reason they're committing crimes, they're threatening people's lives. And so I think that there's, I always just draw the line between violent offenders and those that are guilty of whether it's dealing drugs, half of which are legal now, or whether it's a property crime. I think there has to be a different solution for those. And, and if we came up with other solutions, we would unclog the courts. I think we could improve society by emphasizing community service and emphasizing other sort of forms of retribution, contributing to society as opposed to removing those people from society. And I think that you might find a generally more empathetic and healthier society. I think the health of a society is really poorly reflected in how brutally we treat medium offenders, somebody that steals a car. And if they go to jail for five, ten years for, you know, grand theft, larceny. I'm not sure that society has been improved that way. I think there might be other ways for that person to serve society and also not clog our prisons. And it's far more expensive, as you and I both know, to, to put somebody in a prison than it is to so many other approaches to justice. I mean, it's our prisons are incredibly expensive, and at this point, the Prison guards, unions, and the private prison industry are all incentivized to create ways to fill these prisons that they build. And so the California Prison Guard Union is so powerful that, you know, especially in the 90s, they were instrumental in the buildup of the prisons and in the passing of three strikes and you're out. It, it guaranteed that they would continue to be a growth industry. And that's, you know, a sign of a pretty sick society that we find ways and laws and create laws to fill the prisons. Do you agree? Is that what you think is going on, that the laws are, are being created for the purposes of economic gain for the private prison industry? We have quite a lot of power, but, you know, it's been well documented that in the 90s. I mean, what happened here in California in three strikes, like the prison guard union was, they put quite a lot of money toward that. It was a referendum, you know. We had a referendum system in California, and so they were uh, major funders of that law. And, I mean, that is a very sick system where those that are paid to guard prisoners can form a union, cope dues, and that those dues go toward more punitive laws to fill more prison cells. I mean, that is so diabolical, so beyond Orwellian or Kafkaesque, the fact that we live in such a society and that it happened here in California is just beyond belief. But I think there are very often, I think, questionable motives for why the sentencing is so harsh and why we uh, continue to incarcerate so many. I mean, whether it's mandatory minimums, or whether it's uh, you know eroding judges' ability to uh, consider and, and be flexible in their own sentencing, I think it all points to I think a very a strange uh, strain in the American psyche. So on the dividing line of violent crime, right? So so your your judge Eggers or your legislator Eggers. And you would draw that dividing line between violent crime and nonviolent crime. We talked about Lori Laughlin's case as an example. That's sort of obviously a high-profile white-collar example from the news. But what do you do with people who will repeatedly and, – and, and so the critic would say, okay, I get it. 
violent criminals, first offense might have to be specifically deterred by being put in prison so that they don't commit that same type of crime or some other violent crime that's sort of indicative of their inability to control themselves. Nonviolent criminals, let's say the first time around, drug dealers, income tax fraudsters, admissions fraudsters, um, they don't go to jail. But what do you do about the individual who then does it again and again? In other words, who's not deterred by public shaming, by you know, um, um, having to do community service, pay a fine. Are there other types of punishment, by the way, that you think I'm missing for the nonviolent criminal? I don't know. I think it would be worth trying to see if we do have a really different rate of recidivism w- when it comes to a nonviolent, somebody embezzles. Uh, we talked about, mm-hmm. you know, there was a case of a woman in who had fled New Orleans after Katrina and then she had embezzled a maybe a couple thousand dollars from a Walmart, I think it was. And she ended up doing prison time for that. That's a, an affront to humanity. <laughs> that, that is just uh, unconscionable. And I think uncivilized. It's just, it's barbaric. It's unenlightened. It does nobody any good. This woman had kids and they were without their mother for all that time. So society hasn't been served, especially since the store that she embezzled from did not press charges and did not want her punished in that way. She returned the money and that should be the beginning or her debt to society being paid back. A desperate woman embezzled a few thousand dollars. She should do community service. She should be with her kids and there should be no more suffering for anybody for something so minor and without a victim. (laughs) There was no victim to that crime. Victimless crimes really deserve very nuanced solutions, don't you think? Even when it comes to, you know, again, we've talked about this before, but the tens or hundreds of thousands of people were put in jail, whether it was a week or years, for possession or dealing with marijuana. How do we reckon with that? You know, something that was illegal and probably wrongfully illegal, and now it's not illegal, and those hundreds of years or thousands of years that were thrown away with all of those people for something that's no longer legal. It is very hard, I think. Is that okay? Are we okay with that? Something that so many people, so many lives upended, families upended, kids growing up without parents because they sold pot, you know, and now now it's okay to do that. It, it gives you pause, I think, when victimless crimes like that, when the law can change and we've upended so many lives where we can be so wrong. It really gives you pause. And I think that crimes of aggression, I think our approach to them, I think that they are. Um, we know they're wrong and we know we're unsafe when those people are not taken away from society for however long. But I think that these other victimless crimes, they're in a completely different category. And the fact that we mix all of these people together and mix these crimes together, I think is also a sign of an unenlightened society. And I think that when we can't see nuance, and when we can't delineate between dealing pot or assaulting another human being violently, I think that's hard to defend. You know, I, as you know, my, my thinking on this topic has evolved and is evolving. I'm with you and I'm on board with the violent versus nonviolent crime distinction. I think where I part ways a little bit with your thinking on this are extreme cases like Bernie Madoff, right? Someone who is essentially knowingly destroying hundreds, thousands of lives, right? Taking money away from people, knowing that that's their retirement funding and that they've worked their whole life for. I view someone like that as as deserving of imprisonment as I do someone who committed a violent crime. He's reading books and watching TV all day. Well, what do you want to, what's, what's our option? I mean, we can have more retributivist, you know, approaches to, to impart incarceration, which I'm assuming you're not going to be in favor of. I mean, what do we do with someone like Bernie Madoff? Well, I think he could improve society by, for example, what if he had to work full time for Habitat for Humanity, you know, for the next hundred thousand days, you know, however long it's going to be for the rest of his life, he is a volunteer building homes or he is doing work that uh, no one else wants to do, but he's improving society. He's not a danger to anybody. He's not going to have access to anybody's bank accounts again. And he would be in a position giving back to the society that he stole so much from. I know that that sounds a little radical, but I 
think if you think about this guy sitting and having all day that he is watching TV or playing ping pong or whatever else he's doing in his uh, minimum security prison, I don't know if that's any better. What is the point? How is that getting justice for the, his victims more so than if he were actively contributing? I think if you asked his victims, and we've discussed previously whether the victim's opinion actually is something that should matter in, in European systems. Um, it doesn't. Whether someone is a likable or not likable defendant uh, who has a lot of people saying good things about them or, or their victims that say very bad things about that person, the crime is judged by the individual crime. I think the victims, though, in, in our system of Bernie Madoff or someone like him that does such egregious, engages in such egregious and long term prolonged. Uh, heartless conduct, they would say probably to a person that Bernie Madoff should not uh, have the opportunity to uh, live a normal life or even a life that is encumbered by having to help people and help a habitat for humanity or, or whatever. They, I think they would say that that justice in, in a retributivist sense requires someone like that to pay a, a great price that'll never be as big as the harm he inflicted. If he had to actually work every day and give back, isn't that a bigger price than sitting in a bed and watching TV all day? I think he would like to be back and give back to society uh, in in a way. So he would probably agree uh, that that is a better allocation of his particular resources. Uh, But I think from a systemic perspective, I mean, I just, you know, I get the distinction between violent crime and nonviolent crime, but I do think there are certain kinds of nonviolent crime. We don't want to get too stuck on Bernie Madoff, but what about people who commit multiple offenses who are incorrigible or at least have proven themselves to be not amenable to rehabilitation in the sense of anything short of prison, right? That's the whole theory of incremental punishment. And look, I've got good friends who don't believe in any prison, who don't believe anyone should ever go to prison. People who I respect but don't agree with on this one. Let's say somebody steals a car. Or commits a murder. They, don't, they shouldn't be in prison. They should be, they should be rehabilitated. I mean, I'm not saying you. <laughs> Although you are a good friend, I'm not referring to you on this one. I'm referring to, to a particular person I'm thinking about who's in the criminal justice system. But what do you do with the repeat offender, right? You give them a chance, they screw it up. Lori Laughlin continues to commit the same kind of offenses if she had a bunch of kids. You know, uh, that's maybe a bad example, but like, what do you do with someone like that? Yeah, I think it's still ramped up in terms of that punishment. Um, maybe restricting movement, you know, maybe you, you take away certain privileges, I guess. There's financial penalties for sure so that they feel it, but I still think that prisons are for the worst offenders, and I don't think that we should be putting nonviolent offenders in, in cages. And I keep it that simple because it's understandable. And I think the more we think about it, and the fact that so many societies would never think of putting a Lori Laughlin in prison for a day, we have to think, well, what, what do they know that we don't know? And who's the more enlightened society? And I, it's very hard to think of ourselves where we incarcerate more than anything else in the world and we still have the death penalty as like the more civilized or in society. It's an indefensible position. We are definitely the more barbaric society. And then the question is, do we need to be because we have a more violent society? And I don't think that that's the case either. If we were to say, okay, no more prison for nonviolent offenders, I think you would see this improvement of society that would be pretty dramatic in 10 years because I'm a passionate about community service. I'm passionate about required service. I'm, I think that every college grad or high school grad should do a year of service. And I think service as a solution to any time a society falls short or a human falls short, I think that has ripple effects that are so endless. If you can think of more and more ways that people can serve instead of being thrown away, then you have the benefit to society, new schools, new homes, new trails cut in national parks, just like they did with the Citizens Conservation Corps in World War II. If you have more and more ways that people can repay their debt by actively contributing to the nation as opposed to being removed from it, I think that you have a stronger country and more empathetic one too. 
and uh, you have these uh, offenders who are working among you. Uh, you know, I think when you see people picking up garbage on the side of the road, that's an example of a system that's working. It is a minor humiliation to be doing that with a yellow vest. I don't think if those people are DUI offenders, which a lot of them are, there's no way they're going to drink and drive again, I think, working all day on the side of the highway picking up garbage. I think that that is an effective deterrent. It also happens to have improved the roadside, a very minor improvement, but I think that's sort of a civilized form of repayment of your society, you know, your debt to society. Don't you think? Yeah, I think, look, I think we're in agreement like 95% of the way. Again, I think that there has to be sort of a terminal point where you need prison as a threat for those who violate again and again and again and again, even if they're nonviolent crimes that they commit. I think there has to be some incremental punishment. And when, you know, working on the roadside and shame and um, fines and so forth don't work, you do have to have at the end of the tunnel prison. But I agree with you on the mass incarceration point. I agree with you on the nonviolent crime point. I'm still a little bit struggling with why a Bernie Madoff morally doesn't deserve to go to jail and a person who commits, let's say, an assault does. I think arguments can be made that a Bernie Madoff who engages in sustained exploitation for years is morally a worse person than someone who loses their temper and punches someone in the nose uh, in a bar fight. That's a nuance there. If you're talking to somebody who gets in a bar fight, I don't think should be in jail either. You know, this is where the nuance has to be allowed. And I think that but we really have to think, what is the point of prison? Is it humiliation and shame, or is it to remove a dangerous person from society to protect us? You know, I don't know. And again, I just think, I sort of operate from a principle is how do we reduce this prison population so that it's not such a shameful thing for our country? Who are these people in prison and who really belongs there? And when you get to Bernie Madoff, yeah, there's going to be a lot of debate. But is prison the best place for him to repay his debt? I just don't know. I think that there are probably better solutions. And then when you get into the full spectrum of white-collar crime, then you can find, I think, endless other ways to really radically improve society by putting that person to work for the country to repay that debt. And I think that they can be very useful. And then when you're talking about nonviolent crimes like, you know, dealing drugs, then those people might need help, might need substance abuse help, might need a lot of things. Or maybe they're 18 years old and they need a path to college, community college, or a path to a career. They're way too young to be throwing, throwing those people away for a nonviolent crime. I think when you break down who the people are in prison and why, I think you're going to find a hardened core of people that might need to do some time. Not life very often, but there are plenty of people that have committed crimes so heinous that they might present a danger and should be removed from society for however long. But even then, we have to get into the nuances of just how long is the right amount of time to be put in a cage. Well, and I, you know, one of the things I've always valued about our conversations is is nuance. And you'll be happy to hear that, frankly, if I trace the arc of our relationship from the Daily Illini and Mike Magazine days to the present, I think it's fair to say that I've moved closer to your view uh, than the other way around. So you obviously have some persuasive powers. And it's not just obviously because of our conversations, but but I think your wish for a conversation about the criminal justice system and reform of the criminal justice system obviously is something that has been granted. We're now, uh, although through very, very sad circumstances, and we're now right in the middle of it, and I'm going to just predict that there are going to be fundamental reforms that are going to probably not satisfy uh, everyone's wishes, but they're going to move us in the right direction and have us reconsider uh, some of our theories of punishment and theories of criminal justice, and that will move us, I think, uh, towards a more empathetic, and frankly, also responsible way of dealing with people who violated our norms um, in a way that we think deserve criminal sanction. The one last sort of topic I want to just circle back to is the notion of defunding the police. And I know we're talking about a reallocation of, of funds, not a removal of funds altogether necessarily. 
Are you concerned, and I'm thinking of cases like the uh, Ahmad Arbery case in Georgia, where, you know, as, as you probably read, you know, these uh, father and son team were purportedly attempting to affect some sort of a citizen's arrest and then shot Ahmad Arbery. And I think a very good argument can be made that Arbery was engaging in self-defense against a, an aggressor, which is to say the son, and was shot in the process of engaging in justified self-defense. Aren't you concerned, though, that if the police are defunded and the scope of their actions are much more limited, that citizens will either by necessity or by habit engage in a greater amount of self-help and in, in, in self-policing? And isn't that a bad thing for our justice system? Um. I think that's a leap that I can't follow you uh, with. I think that those two lunatics that pursued Arbery, this was a modern-day lynching. It was had every hallmark of a lynching. And we cannot, I think, make any decisions fearing that this will unearth more lunatics like that. I think that, again, if you say, call the police if there's a violent crime, Call the police if there's somebody breaking into your house. That's what they're there for. That they solve these crimes. They're very good at a show of force to uh, prevent violent acts or to hold those violent offenders accountable. If you see somebody walking across a construction site, that's not really a police matter. That's, that's a nothing matter. Nothing happened, you know. And if you want to say to that person, hey, what's, what's going on? Oh, well, you know, I, I, whatever reason that they have, that doesn't mean you show up with a shotgun. That is an you know, right. evidence of the American madness and the fact that people feel like this inherent vigilantism that is sort of baked into so much of our identity. But again, a civilized country, you might approach somebody that's on your property and say, hey, uh, what's going on? You're on my property. You would not do so with a shotgun. You wouldn't chase that person down the street. You wouldn't threaten them. That's uniquely American madness. And again, if you feel like the police need to be called because there's a break-in at your construction site, then you call the police. This was such a indefensible, was no product of under-policing or lack of faith in police or anything. These were an act of outrageous, racist violence. And again... It had every hallmark of a lynching. These men planned on violence, were looking for an excuse for violence, and I think everything was geared toward a violent act, toward this uh, innocent man. And so I don't think that reducing the scope of police work would at all or should rationally lead to more vigilantism. You know, I think that more and more these acts are being held accountable with the fact that so many are filmed, and I think it's just going to decrease these acts. And I think that the fact that every time somebody like this father and son team are held accountable and are in prison and they're not going to get out, I think it disincentivizes the next racist vigilantes, uh, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I think the Arbery case is a shameful, shameful case. And, and frankly, it also speaks to your earlier comment about the inherent conflict sometimes of prosecutors, you know, prosecuting either current or former police officers, because at least in much of the reporting that I've seen, it took quite a bit of uh, effort to get the father-son duo um, prosecuted in that case. And the initial reaction was not to prosecute them for what appears to be a murder of Arbery. Well, Dave, I, I want to make sure that I don't keep you for a full two hours so that I can't be accused of keeping you hostage here. That said, I also want to give you, as a matter of professional and personal courtesy, uh, the last word. And so, you know, and that could be in the form of if you were, you know, king for a day and could, could make all the changes you want. Is there something we haven't talked about? Uh, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but is there something in, we haven't talked about in terms of criminal justice reform, the current public debate about these topics, which are just incredibly complicated? My question for you is, what can happen with these cases from the past to Cynthia Clements in Elgin, Illinois? Is there any way to hold them accountable now five years, or well, actually this was only two years ago? What can happen now? 
Look, practically speaking, these are really tough cases. There's a statute of limitations issue in, in, in a lot of situations. I've seen cases prosecuted successfully even after the statute ran on theories of conspiracy. You can think of the Henry Hyde case in Illinois where it was essentially the cover-up, the payoff of a witness that was the crime. But practically speaking, I think a lot of these cases are going to be very difficult to pursue. And I'm not talking about cases like, you know, where, where the Buffalo police pushed down the 75-year-old man or, or, or Rashad Brooks or George Floyd or Ariel Roman. I mean, all those cases, I think, are and should and will be prosecuted appropriately. I think these historical cases, just as a practical matter, are very difficult to prove. We've done it, you know, I mean, in Chicago, in the family secrets case, you know, we prosecuted a police officer for conduct that went back many, many years. Um, but those are rare cases, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're not worthy prosecutions. I'm not saying that they're not worthy of of consideration, but you're asking me a very practical question, which is, you know, what is going to happen and what is likely or what should happen, and they can just be very challenging cases to prosecute. But I will also say that the, the days of because a police officer on the stand says something happened, that the juries automatically credit that with truth. I think those days may be over. I mean, are you worried that it's the pendulum might swing too dramatically the other way, that police officers are essentially disbelieved just by dint of what they're doing? Is that a concern you have? You know, I think that this is a reckoning with the pendulum has mm-hmm. to swing the other way. And once we get down to a reasonable amount of violent interactions and where we don't have a thousand police shootings a year, we've got to reduce that to... Um, a civilized number, which would be, I don't even know what that number would be, but in, in keeping with other civilized societies. And once we do that, then we'll see where we're at. public has to feel safe and not menaced by the police departments that are designed to serve them. And I think Minneapolis was the best case, and I don't think that that police department was, generally speaking, had inspired a feeling of safety. They had killed a lot of this is a reckoning. Make it work. I think that if we do make it work, it's going to be better for the cops, it's going to be better for the families, and it's better for the society. Well, thanks for having me, Marcus, and uh, going over this. And, uh, Dave, yeah, no, I've got to say that obviously the devil's in the details and getting down to how we achieve some of these things. I think we've covered actually a lot of really good avenues for attacking some of these problems that have plagued us and have plagued our, our society and, and also others for many years. I'm looking forward to sitting down with you in one year, two years, five years, 10 years and seeing right a little retrospective of our conversation today about how effective Uh, we have been, how dedicated the criminal justice system is to actually putting reform into practice and not just talking about it. I'm hopeful that a lot of the things we're talking about are going to happen. I think they have to happen. I think we're at a crossroads where there is no other alternative and frankly shouldn't be another alternative but to reconsider some of these bad traditions, bad practices. But I'll look forward to sitting down with you, like I said, some point in the future and we can see about which of these things we were right or wrong or or what worked and what didn't work. But I just want to thank you for the candid conversation and for your part, uh, which you've historically, you've had a part in, in really thinking about criminal justice issues and I know your voice that a lot of people listen to for good reason. And I look forward to watching and, and, and listening to how you yourself push this conversation forward and use your platform to affect real change. Uh, thanks for the conversation, dear insight, as always. Well, thanks for the conversation, Dave, and thanks for the friendship, and uh, we'll talk soon. Thanks for that. This concludes this episode of White Collar Briefly. Please visit whitecollarbriefly.com where you can subscribe to our blog and find additional updates on current white collar and compliance topics. White Collar Briefly, a Perkins Cooey mini pod, copyright 2020 by Perkins Cooey LLP. Thank you for listening.